Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for your spirit of truth that rises in us this morning that we might be able to study your word that reproves each and every one on every single day. Lord God, we ask you right now to forgive us of our sins or transmission transgression against you and you alone. Our sins of omission and our sins of commission, Father God, we ask right now to allow us to lay it upon your throne, your altar, Lord God, that we might be forgiven and that we might be able to heed your grace and your mercy to show ourselves to be true to your form and your image, Lord Jesus. We ask you right now to come in this particular time and this particular season to bless those who are injured, who are sick, who are in harm and hurt and danger. Lord God, to remedy them and put them in a place according to thy will, which will effectually produce your glory. Lord God, we ask you right now to prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls, Lord God, that we might be able to study your word and show ourselves acceptable in thy sight, holy and reproved. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, for you truly are my rock and my redeemer. In the name of the most precious, the most loved, the one whose name is above all names, in the name of Jesus Christ we say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you this morning to an American Conservative's exploration of the inspired Word of God. Live from the nation's capital, it's 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Our purpose on this Sunday and every Sunday is that we study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. That we're not trying to push one way or the other, but we're trying to receive your word, his word, and to live according to his will and his means. I want to thank everybody who's here this morning, Mrs. Biggs, who's watching via Ustream and live stream. Uh, I love you. So glad that you're here with me this morning. I want to thank Dean. Thank you, sir, for being in the chat room. Glad to have you here so early in the morning. And uh, Deborah Blair, we love you. We thank you so much for being here as well. I want to study with you today exactly his word and specifically on the subject of Kwanzaa. Now, I know a lot of you might be slightly upset with, by the end of this, and, and some of you might not even listen after this. But it's not my responsibility to tell you what you want to hear. It's my responsibility to teach the truth that we might be set free. Before we begin... I want to take you to scripture since we're coming off of the holy day of Christmas, Christ Mass, and we're preparing for the new year. We must always be apparent in our thought that there are those who wish to use good for evil. And those who, out of evil, wish to try to produce something good. Our role is always to be dependent on the one who is always good to do that which is good. I know for a lot of people, because as we talk about Kwanzaa today, you will say, well, my mama celebrates Kwanzaa. So if my mama say it's all right, then it's all right. <clears throat> Some of you will say, well, my pastor said it's okay. So if my pastor say it, and I know he wouldn't try to lead me the wrong way, 
then it must be all right. Some of you will say, well, I've been going to this church for a number of years, and they preach the gospel. What's wrong with having a little bit of Kwanzaa? Let me take you to the scriptures. We will begin in the ninth chapter of Isaiah. And we will study today to show ourselves approved and hopefully someone who rightfully divides the word truth so much so that maybe you might want to rethink those that you have committed your heart to, your soul to, and most importantly, the souls and hearts of those that you hold most dear. I want you to take a look at Isaiah 9. And in this particular scripture, there was not a happy heart in Israel. I mean, the Assyrians were getting ready to come and knock off the ten tribes of Israel and take them into captivity. And it begins to speak in such a fashion. Ninth chapter of Isaiah, the first verse. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. They talked about God chastising Israel for idolatry. And after, afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. Isaiah 9 verse 2. The people that walked in darkness, and I want you to pay very close attention uh, to this scripture because this is not often referred to when we talk about the sixth verse. Okay? often not referred to but maybe should because it creates the context in which we see the light the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine God has been God to the world and to his own people, he has been faithful, despite the fact that they have turned from him to other gods. And I want you to, we're going to take a look at this term, gods. And we're also going to take a look at the terms, idolatry, in just one moment. Because God has corrected me, even he's auto-corrected me, even as we study in terms of where we're going to go with this particular study. Isaiah 9, 3 reads, Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. Mm. Uh, let, let me put this another way. Thou hast multiplied the number of members in your church, yet have not increased the joy. Thou hast increased the number of ministers on your staff, but you have not increased the joy. Thou hast created a number of cars in your driveway, but you have not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You see, the only time that we ever see you happy is when you're doing something that's for your own good. I know. Isaiah 9, verse 4. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. Listen, there is someone that will come and relieve you of all the strife that you're going through. In Isaiah 9, verse 5, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments royaled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Here's the hope. Isaiah 9, verse 5, verse 6. Forgive me. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Let me put this in the chat row for those who are following along at home on the exceptionalconservativeshow.com at the SHR 
Media Live site. We put the notes for the study so that you might be able to go back to it during the course of the day. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Here's the hope. The hope that we just came out of. The hope that we've been spending so much money trying to show the world. Mm. For unto us a child is born. And, and is, there's no and here. There is a pause of the comma. There's no and here. For unto us a child is born. This is the messianic prophecy. Unto us a son is given. The only begotten son. We talked about this last week on our program. They are talking about Jesus. Now, Watch what happens after the begotten son part. That unto us the son is given. Colon. And the government. The government. And now for us, a lot of people are under the impression that the government means something else other than what it really means. And I want to take you to Lexicon Strong's H. 4951. You all are going to get a whole 45 to 50 minutes of study here today. Ain't going to be no pause to sit in. <laughs> it's coming to you. Um, and I want you to understand what he's talking about. Rule, dominion, government. Rule, dominion, government. It means to rule. What's ruling in your life? What has dominion in your life? Is it the government that has rule over you? Is it the professor that you study with who has rule over you? Is it your desire to be good to everybody that you might not hold anybody ill? Is that rule of government? What government? What empire? are you pursuing? All of us say in our hearts, in our minds, and our souls that the government that we pursue, the Mizra that we pursue, is the kingdom of God. But the truth of the matter is, that which has power, contention with us, exertion of force against us, that perseveres in us, may not necessarily be that which we pursue. It may not be the kingdom of God. The primitive root to this word uh, is H8280, Sarah. And it refers to the leader, the commander. Who is the prince? Who is the person waging the war? While for many of us, it should be us following Christ to wage war against the world and its holidays. Often, we have adjoined the world and we fight as Christians against our God in his holy days. I know you don't want to hear this this morning, but that's okay. I got to tell you. That way you can choose to be in the right order. You see, your government is the first government he's talking about. It is whom you rule. You rule your body. You have self-control over who you think you are. Then you look at the family that becomes the next that comes upon that standing. And then... You look at your neighbor, who happens to be sometimes governor. And then you look at your government. 
and your economy and education and then finally your faith or is it religion ah that's what we're talking about today is it faith or is it your religion is Jesus your faith or is he your religion is Jesus the one who rules you or does the world's religions help you rule Jesus I want to take you now to Kwanzaa because once you hear these words it should drive you to the point of a reckoning where you attend it should drive you to a point of a reckoning of saying you know what if the place that I assemble practices this evil then I must not be a part of it I don't care if my mama loves it now I, I want you to understand something um, Jesus came that he might bring a sword. He came to be a dividing force. I know you all want to talk about unity. <coughs> but can I take you to Mark chapter 3, 33 for a moment. Mark chapter 3, 33. Because some of you have a greater relationship with your mom and your dad and your pastor than you do with Jesus Christ. And that's okay. Knowing it is half the battle. The other part of the battle is overcoming the war. In Mark 3, 33, Jesus is speaking. So it must be important. Apparently, his family think he's crazy. He has left his church because they're teaching Kwanzaa. And he's saying, I'm just jiving with you, but get my point. Get my speaking here. And I'm using analogy in a metaphorical sense so that you might understand the gravity of the situation. How important this message is. Mark 3, 33. Jesus is out there preaching about God. The Pharisee, Pharisees, the Sadducees think he's crazy. The Romans think he's crazy. Many are speaking underneath their breath that he's trying to be king and they need to get this man off the block quickly. We don't need this kind of trouble in our kingdom. You see, where we rule, we don't mind you talking about having a God, but we do mind about you spreading the truth about God. Mark 3, 33, and he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? You see, Sometimes people think that if their mama or their daddy don't approve of the truth of God's word, they've been held so long under the bondage of tradition uh, that if someone speaks the truth, then they are the culprits and they can't be a part of. They got to be ostracized and kept away because they're evil. And they just try to stop you from enjoying, enjoying, exousia, enjoying what God would have for you. I want you to understand, Jesus said about his own mama, and I know some of you all hold her more precious than you do Jesus. Who is my mother or my brethren in Mark 3.33? In Mark 3.34, he said, and he looked round about them, on them, which said about him and said, behold, my mother and my brethren, Oh, these are my family. My family would never lead me into lie and try to uphold the lie 
in order to maintain a position of responsibility in my life. They would never attempt to coerce me with traditions when truth is so availed. They would never, never try to use religion, no matter how bastardized the religion, would never try to use religion to interfere with my faith. And trust me, there's a difference. Religion is what man creates. Faith is what God's given. If you ever have to worry about what you're studying, you have to ask yourself, am I on the off-ramp 1A going to religion, or I am still on 495 going in faith? Which one of these? Because if I've gone off into religion, my government is what I'm trying to keep, and I'm trying to get rid of the kingdom of God. That is the truth, and I hope it sets you free. Mark 33, 35 says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, whom, whosoever, shall do the will of God. The same is my brother and my sister and my mother. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to ask yourself by the end of this particular message today, for those who are listening at home, if I'm being taught something in my church that doesn't lead me to the truth, am I doing the will of God? Or am I working against God? And enslaving myself because God doesn't want men to be enslaved. God wants you to be free. And he wants you to be his sister and his brother and his mother. The only way you can do that, at least in that position at that time, he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's well beyond the conception. <clears throat> but if you're going to be his son, you should not teach harm, hurt, and danger and call it an acceptable marriage of a religion to your faith. I want to give you all some history right now. And you're listening to an American conservative's exploration of the inspired word of God. Today's topic matter is Kwanzaa. Wobs, the witness of Christ's army to the world. I want you to understand that I have no angst against anybody. I ain't a hater unless I am hating what God hates. I want you all to get a very good understanding of some stuff real quick. One is I want to give you what the definition of a God is, at least in its etymological origins. Uh, in the in the part, which is, well, to go as far back, that which is invoked. Is from the from as far back uh, the original context of the word, which is gut, that which is invoked, that which is called upon. Now, why, if we are studying God, why are we talking about that which is called upon? What that which is invoked? Because. <coughs> Whose ever name is above any name is the one that you would call upon as the image of your God. I want to give you the old English God in this particular case, being the supreme being, the deity, the in this particular case, the Christian God, as the image of a God, God-like person. Is someone that we hold in such revere that we turn to it 
to look at it as Isaiah 9, verse 6. Let's take a look at Isaiah 9, verse 6. I'm going to go there and put it back in the chat roll. We're going to go back to it now. Isaiah 9, verse 6. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Now watch this. And his name shall be called. What are we talking about? What are you, Name? Jesus. I, I mean, yeah, I called out on Jesus' name. I, 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 everybody called Jesus' name. Really. Let us check out uh, Isaiah 9, verse 6. And let us find out exactly what they're referring to here. Shem. That's H8034. H8034. Shem. Now, why is Shem so important? Because while it also refers back to Noah's children, you can easily go back to that. Look at Shem. This is what it means in its Hebrew origin. It means the name. The name. As designation of God. The name. Shem. The name. In Judaic faith, you don't even say the name of God because you are to revere it so. The respect so great that when you use the name, it would cause your heart, your mind, your soul to just tremble. That his name would be above every name. His name would be so great that you wouldn't use his official name, Yahweh. You, you would use attributes to refer to him. Well, what attributes would I refer to, Ken? What are you talking about here? Isaiah 9, because uh, he's wonderful. Well, yeah, Pele. Pele. Strong's H, 6382. Strong's H, 6382. When we look at that particular scripture, when we say Pele, we are talking about extraordinary, hard to understand. I want you to understand something. Extraordinary, hard to understand. The acts of judgment and redemption whose wonder can only be God. Just want you to know those two things. Your God should be so great <coughs> that when they say wonderful, wonderful in the definition here would be someone extraordinary and hard to understand or someone whose acts of judgment or redemption are far greater than man. <clears throat> so when you say wonderful, you're talking about Jesus. When you say counselor, you're referring to H3289, Yachts. Yachts. A primitive word. One, and this is very important as we're going to study the seven principles of blackness. That, that's what Kwanzaa really is. I, I hope you all know that. It is the seven principles of blackness. Right there should have been your cue that you need to get up out of that church. Yat means to advise, to consult, to give counsel, purpose. Your purpose comes from that counselor. Your device 
comes from that counselor. Your plan becomes the plan of the counselor. Your counselor is the one who makes a way out of no way for you. Who gives you the will to do his will. Wow. Wonderful. Counselor, I don't know how you can proceed in doing anything of merit on the earth if you have not sought his counsel. Let's go back and see something else here. We call him wonderful. We call him counselor. The government's on his shoulders. And then they call him the mighty God. Mighty. God, I don't know if it, Gibor is the term there. It's H1368. If you don't know what mighty is, it means champion. It means champion. It means hero. Powerful. If your hero is still someone who wishes to divide and conquer with hatred, lies, and innuendo, then you're not here, you are here. And you call yourself following Christ. It's time to make a new day. And then on top of that, Gibor El. El meaning God. That's H410. H410. When they say God in this particular sense, El, they are referring to, and let me make it plain for you, God, the one true God, Jehovah. The one, the mighty one. The one whose rank is above any other. When you affix a religion to the mighty L, who is God and God alone, then you have assaulted the kingdom. And worse yet, many do it out of political correctness because you just want to get along with everybody. They also call him the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Shalom. Shalom. That means your completeness, your soundness, your welfare, your peace comes from only one. Let me put that in the chat roll for those who are following along at home and just want to get along with everybody. I just want to get along. Every religion is the same religion. And we're just talking, uh, believing in God. And it's just the same thing. And we, I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm not trying to tell nobody to do nothing or be nothing. You know, I just want them to have what they have and me to have what I want to have. I, I just want to be yeah, at peace. Ka, ka, ka. You won't be at peace until you understand. Shalom. Your completeness, your soundness, your welfare, your peace comes from the mighty God, the one God, the one true God, who is wonderful and counselor. So why are we talking about this subject today, Ken? You, you, you drilled in the point. I get it. I get it. I should be thinking about Jesus. That's what I should be thinking about in everything that I say and everything I do. I get it, Ken. I get it. But there's still room for Kwanzaa, man, because the white man still is trying to keep the black man down. And as long as the white man is trying to persecute uh, uh, and persevere and take away that which is the purpose of the black man, then the black man will not know peace. And the peace that cometh unto man shall never know true peace, which comes from God. You know how all that sounds good? No, all I got to do is do that for a lot of people, and it sounds good. But it's foolishness. God does not 
divide you by the color of your skin. He divides you by your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. If anything separates you from the love of God, then you need to separate it from the love of your life. Kwanzaa. William J. Bonetta writes, <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> however, the line that I have quoted is the model of a real organization. That quoted line is, anywhere we are, us is. A real organization that was originally named United Slaves but now calls itself the organization us for simply us or us <clears throat> it was created over 50 years ago in southern california by a black racist i bet you didn't know that let me put this in the chat roll for all you kwanzaa seekers and you know where to go if you need any question to be answered you can easily address me i'm here His name, the racist name was Ron N. Everett, but later had assumed the name Milana Karenge. You see, the name matters. You see, I have to sound <clears throat> like I know what I'm talking about in order to persuade. You see, Satan is a light, and he will alight himself in such a fashion that he's attractive enough to bring you in and to entrap you and wise enough to convince you that you're doing this of God's accord. <clears throat> William J. Bonetta writes, Ron N. Everett, but later had assumed the name Milana Karenge. Karenge, known chiefly as the inventor of Kwanzaa, a fake African holiday. I'm going to repeat that for you once more. Kwanzaa is a fake African holiday that was contrived in 1966, the year of the birth of the exceptional one, Ken McClinton. Karenge created a fake holiday. Now, if you are to know what I said about religion, that faith is that 495 road that you continue on, but there are sometimes off-ramps called religions that people will go off on and then try to make their going off in that venue like it was purposeful, it was intentional, and everyone who follows them off on the off-ramp, although they're being led astray and off the cart way, or the highway to Christ, uh, they're going to be all right because there is more than one way. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But already, if Kwanzaa is a fake, and you use the name of Jesus to say that it is true, then it is not God who has lied, it's you who have lied, and you have led people astray. But I only had good intentions. The people that murder only have good intentions. The people that commit adultery only have good intentions. The people that steal only have good intentions. The people that obsess about other people's property only have good intentions. The people that dishonor their mother and their father only have good intentions. The people that use the name of the Lord in vain only have good intentions. You're not graded for your good intentions. You're graded for the works that you do as unto the Lord and under the will of God. To prepare hearts and minds and souls to receive a lie and justify it as equal to the truth. Oh, that's evil. It's surely as we speak, that's evil. want you also to know William J. Benata writes 
Karenge, known chiefly as the inventor of Kwanzaa, a fake African holiday that he contrived in 1966, had enjoyed a truly colorful career. He was a prominent black nationalist during the 1960s when his organization was involved in various violent operations. He was sent to prison in 1971 after he and some of his pals tortured two women with a soldering iron and a vice among other things, I want you to understand something. If you ever read the report, that soldering iron and that vice, it make you think twice about the mindset of the person who did it. But Ken, there's redemption. Oh, people can change. People are changed through Christ, not through good intentions. He emerged from prison in 1974 and a few years later in a maneuver that even the Kingfish might have found difficult. He got himself installed as the chairman of the Department of Black Studies at California State University at Long Beach. CSULB wasn't the only American university that got the racial willies during the 1970s and set up a 10-pot black studies department. But CSULB, as far as I know, was the only one that hired a chairman who was a violent felon. Want to go on. Kwanzaa is supposed to be celebrated from December 26 to January 1. Last night our president of the United States of America celebrated the first day of Kwanzaa. We'll talk about those seven pillars of blackness in a few moments. It competes with Christmas and Hanukkah while incorporating some echoes of both gift giving in a ceremony built around a seven hold candle holder that recalls Judaism's seven branch menorah. I want you to understand that Karenge hated Christianity and Karenge hated Judaism. You'll see that later on. Ken Karenge has concocted some bits of lore, lingo, and mumbo-jumbo that are intended to make Kwanzaa look like something out of Africa instead of something from Los Angeles County, but his efforts have been feeble. If you scan the official Kwanzaa website, you'll read that the origins of Kwanzaa lie in the first harvest celebrations of Africa, which allegedly are recorded in African history as far back as ancient Egypt and Nubia. But there is no explanation of why any ancient Egyptians or Nubians might have held harvest festivals around the time of the winter solstice. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the middle of December. What are you harvesting? Even in the times of the ancients, this time period would not be the time period, whether you are Jew or Gentile, that you would harvest. You're laying the land waste at this moment, preparing it for the summer plant, the spring plantings. Nothing more. Your harvest is through. But you keep teaching this to the children in your church and the elders, elders in the church and you, because the pastor goes with it because the president did it. It must be true. Karenge's formula for celebrating Kwanzaa requires the use of two ears of maize. But maize, corn, is a new world plant. It wasn't known at all in ancient Africa. You know, Kwanzaa equipment, candles and seven hole candle holders and straw mats from the University of San Cori Press, a company in Los Angeles, also produces the maize that you can purchase since you're a true believer. The outfit evidently is controlled by us and serves as us this marketing unit. It isn't a university press and its name is a mockery. The so-called University of San Cor was an ag aggregation of Islamic schools. Get this. 
Karenge was referring to Islam when he was establishing this, that flourished at Timbuktu in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. No University of Senkur exists today. In Karenge's Kwanzaa lingo, ears of maize are called by the Swahili name Muhindi. In fact, all of the objects that Karenge has worked into Kwanzaa have names taken from Swahili, which the official Kwanzaa website describes as a Pan-African language. Firstly, this has nothing to do with Pan-Africanism. You can ask any Pan-African, anyone from those particular regions, and they will tell you they've never heard of Kwanzaa. You, you want to test me on that? Ask Richard Simpala, who's one of the groups that we support in Uganda. Ask him if Kwanzaa exists in Africa. After he finishes laughing at you, don't be offended, he'll tell you that it doesn't. A Pan-African language in the most widely spoken African language. This laboring of Swahili as a Pan-African language is rubbish. Swahili, a Bantu tongue. Bantu tongue. Look up Bantu. B-A-N-T-U. Tongue that includes many words absorbed from Arabic, from Persian, and from certain Indian languages. It's spoken by about 50 million people, or 7% of Africa's population. Most of those Swahili speakers are concentrated in East Africa. I want you all to know something. Most African slaves that became African Americans, they came from West Africa, not East. <coughs> However, most of those Swahili speakers are concentrated in Eastern Africa in a region that includes Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and a strip of Zaire. That language, or the language that is used most likely in Africa, is actually Arabic. Arabic. He goes on to write, Kwanzaa is a hoax, a hoax built around fake history, pseudo-historical delusions. By attempting to dignify and promote Kwanzaa in the American nation, Prentice Hall has joined in a flim-flam. Yes, this is a hoax. Yes, it is a lie. And now a lot of people would say, well, Ken, then the President of the United States is lying. And I would tell you, yes, both George Bush, George W. Bush, William Jefferson Clinton and Barack Hussein Obama all have been spoiled by the hoax. Yes, American presidents can get it wrong. Yes, they can be hoodwinked and bamboozled. However, some believe in the seven principles of blackness. I want you to understand something that if you take these principles the seven principles of blackness, and you put them up against the gospel of Jesus Christ, you of all men will be weary of the fact that you even brought this sinful, evil crap into your biblical studies. Now, a lot of people say, well, Ken, that's, a, that's a, you're just going a little far, because a uh, pastor, he got his PhD uh, from uh, 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 bamboozle uh, university, uh, and, and he's, he's a well-informed, well-educated. Listen, your education does not guarantee you absolvance from taking on foolishness as if it is truth. Just ask the people who believe in climate change because it is told to them that 97% of scientists believe it. Although that's not how you establish scientific law. The seven principles of blackness. The writer Kevin Coach Collins writes in an article today, Coach is right, about the very same things that I'm talking about today. And in that article, He writes, this will mean nothing to Black Lives Matter. Their business is spreading hatred, and Kwanzaa is an opportunity they will not miss. When hate is your only product, the fires must be constantly stoked. 
Expect to see happy Kwanzaa cards from the Brown, Garner, and Gray families hand-delivered by pimple-faced white morons who want to make the world a better place by defeating racism in America. You do not defeat Satan with Satan. You do not defeat hate with hate. And you do not defeat racism with racism. The only way that you can defeat any of those particular things is with love. Yet, this is the truth. Many people have so little love in their hearts, even though they've given their lives to Christ, that all they can do is hold on to the traditions and the hatred that they had and justify it by the fact that God loves me just the way I am. If that was the case, then he need not send his only begotten son. If he loved you just the way you were, no change would be required. In fact, God would have to be the change. He would have to be the lie. And you would have to be the truth. And God would have to align himself to you to allow you into his kingdom. But he doesn't. And he doesn't have to. Todd Houston in Whizbang writes, The Kwanzaa Khan, a fake holiday created by a rapist and torturer, Thomasine Johnson needed to get the record straight about Kwanzaa, a cultural holiday steeped in African traditions that celebrates family, ethnic pride, and community. With her 11-year-old grandson in tow, check this now, the woman and her child. The 11-year-old grandson in tow, the Missouri City interior designer on Saturday, bought her video camera to shape community center to hear from Father Kwanzaa Malana Karinge in the flesh. How often will we sacrifice our ears <clears throat> and the ears of our children to hear a, hear, hear a lie and call it a truth and then say unto them, you have been set free. I don't have time to go into all the other stuff. I'm going to run out of time, but I want to go over the seven black principles. Number one, unity. To strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. That's a no-no. We may be all the same uh, <coughs> melanin, uh, but let me assure you, Unity will never come because you share the same color of skin. It is by the content of the character and their character aligning up to the Word of God. So if the unity that you want can only come from you denying your faith and accepting the religions of the world, then you of all men are most unworthy, I would say. Kuji Chakalia, people love that name, Kuji Chakalia, self-determination. To define ourselves, name ourselves, name ourselves, whose name should be the highest amongst us? Not my name, not what I want to do, but what his name is and what he wants to do. Name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. No, I think the Word of God should speak for us. In fact, if you believe that, then you also <coughs> believe what the author of this particular text <coughs> says in timeforchange.org, best religion self-determination. You will believe the main goal is, to, is the education to become good human beings who live in peace and happiness and who respect each other as well as the nature with all its creatures. The final result of this development will be some state of paradise. So you believe <coughs> that 
that your acceptance of Jesus Christ, your belief that he exists and that he is rewarder of those that diligently seek his face, you believe <clears throat> that that's the equivalent of someone being reincarnated. Reincarnation is the equivalent of rebirth and regeneration. That's what you're saying. That there are a multitude of ways to Christ. And yet Christ says there is only one way to me. I am the way. And I am the light. I am the truth. Jesus says there's only one way. Religiosity says there's a multitude of ways. Self-determination. Be careful when they come to you and say, do you believe in self-determination? Because that is the acceptance that there are a number of ways to Christ. <clears throat> God bless you, Dean. You take care. You have a great day. I want to finish this off. Finally, the other black this <clears throat> Ujima collective work and responsibility to build and maintain our community. Our community. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you building new stairways to utopia. He dispersed all. Your collective salvation will not come. It is individualistic. Just as your work and reward will be individualistic. Ujama, cooperative economics. That's socialism. There's no other way to say it. It's either socialism or Marxism. <clears throat> socialism by vote, Marxism by force. Nia, purpose, to make our collective vocation the building and development of our community. To restore our people to their traditional greatness. Well, where is their traditional greatness in Kwanzaa? Since it is built on a lie. Is our traditional greatness our lie? Or is it his truth? Kumba, <clears throat> creativity, to do always as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. Would it be better if we did all that we can or should in the name of Jesus, in his way, and leave our world in a place of redemption? And then finally, Imani, faith. And this is how you know that you have split tongues in the pulpit. Their faith says to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, in the righteousness and victory of our struggle. <clears throat> to believe in that says that it is the equivalent of believing in Jesus Christ. They are not the same. So ladies and gentlemen, whether by good nature, noble intent, purposeful, malicious endeavor, the church or the pastor that promotes <clears throat> the black power movements, Kwanzaa, is a lie. And should be the bane of your existence. <clears throat> I will tell you this. That you need to find a Bible believing church. To assemble in. One that is upright. And honest and true with you. And it's not a shame. To tell you that truth. Even at the risk of losing you. Happy New Year. Dean. I wanted to say that to you this morning because some of you all are getting ready to go to church and your pastors have already told you that we're going to celebrate Kwanzaa. That should be first your introduction to preach the gut news of Jesus Christ to someone who needs it. Your pastor needs Jesus Christ. And then secondly, if they refuse, it might mean 
that it's time for you to assemble with those who believe. Noble intentions won't save you. Jesus will. From all of us at a at an American Conservative's expiration of the inspired word of God, we want to thank you so much for being here and staying with us as we go on a little longer than normal. We'll see you in the new year. God bless. <laughs> Thank you.